Hello everyone, welcome to Eye on Africa. Here are the headlines for Friday, May 28th. Germany promises Nigeria, uh, Namibia rather, more than 1 billion euros worth of funding for aid projects as the country recognizes that the massacres its colonial forces committed more than 100 years ago were in fact a genocide. Goma falls silent as 400,000 people flee the city after scientists warn of the possibility of a second and much larger eruption of the Mount Nirugongo volcano. And South Africa releases a report uncovering just how much money invasive species are costing the continent. But first, more than a billion euros worth of funding over the next 30 years. That's the amount of money Germany has pledged to invest in Namibia as it tries to atone for its role in genocide and property seizures in its former colony. Thousands of Herero and Nama people were killed by German forces between 1904 and 1908. Karis Garland has more. In an effort to right historical wrongs, Germany announced it had reached an agreement with Namibia, officially recognizing its colonial killings between 1904 and 1908 as genocide. We will now officially refer to these events as what they are from today's perspective, genocide. In light of the historical and moral responsibility of Germany, we will ask forgiveness from Namibia and the victim's descendants. Germany also said it would fund a 1.1 billion euro rebuilding and development program to benefit the communities affected by the atrocities. The aid is expected to cover infrastructure, healthcare and vocational training projects over 30 years. The German Empire was the colonial power in what was then called German Southwest Africa from 1884 to 1915. In that time, its soldiers brutally repressed several rebellions against land seizures. Historians say German troops killed 65,000 Herero people and 10,000 Namas between 1904 and 1908. Survivors were driven into the desert where many died of thirst or ended up in concentration camps to be used as slave labor. While Germany has previously acknowledged moral responsibility for the killings, it has avoided making an official apology. In 2015, Berlin began formal negotiations with the Namibian government for an agreement that would include an apology. And in 2018, the former colonial power returned skulls and other remains of massacred tribespeople. Well, earlier we had the pleasure of welcoming our contributor Douglas Yates here with us on the set. He explained whether this decision would set a precedent in other countries. Often this is treated as a human rights issue. But reparations is also a political issue. And what we see is where countries are trying to reestablish good relations or build working relations, uh, there'll be recognition of past wrongs and some payment, like Japan is now giving money for comfort women. But where countries are enemies, like uh, or, or where there's a rivalry going on, for example, problems around recognizing the Armenian genocide, not only will there not be reparations, there'll be no trend towards that, but there won't even be recognition. Uh, Doug, um, we've talked a lot about the uh, actual, what the deal actually uh, involves, the Germany reaching out to Namibia, uh, but we've heard also from activists and victim groups uh, and descendants of the people who were actually massacred, and they say they've rejected Germany's deal. They say that this is just PR and that the monetary reparations should actually go to them and their family members rather than just in some potentially obscure funding uh, projects. Yeah. Even though independence has come to Namibia, the Herrera are uh, a minority group. Their, their, their numbers were decimated. They remain kind of like the Native American Indians in the United States or the Aborigines in Australia. So they were excluded from the talks. And where reparations are transitional justice, it's important to involve them in the talks, in the distribution. On the other hand, to be fair, Germany does a lot of development work in Africa, and they know perfectly well that their 30-year program, one and a half billion dollars towards infrastructures, towards training programs, towards health, is going to actually improve the lives of the Herero. I think there's some political flack because the Paramount chiefs would have liked some money to distribute and uh, the optics do look like they were cut out.
Authorities in the Democratic Republic of Congo believe some 400,000 people have fled the eastern city of Goma after it was issued an evacuation order due to fears of a second larger eruption of the mount near Gongo volcano. A first eruption occurred last weekend, claiming three dozen lives and destroying the homes of 20,000 people. Scientists have since recorded hundreds of aftershocks. Olivia Auckland has more from the evacuation zone just across the border in Rwanda. There was a meeting this morning at the governor's office in Goma, which was attended by experts from the Volcano Center. And shortly after the meeting, a broadcast was made saying that there does seem to be magma underneath the city center in Goma, with an extension going into the lake. It was a similar broadcast to the one made by the governor of North Kivu province at 2.30 a.m. on Thursday morning, which sent tens of thousands of people fleeing in different directions. I took my motorbike and drove to the Rwandan border, and I'm currently up in the hills in Rwanda, uh, waiting a little bit before I go back in. Um, masses of people were crossing the border as either was the roads were clogged with traffic, um, and people were walking along the pavements carrying bundles of clothes on their heads. Thousands of others went in the other direction to Sake, which is a town around 20 kilometers from Goma. And the situation in Sake seems to be pretty chaotic. People are sleeping on the floors of churches and schools. There doesn't seem to be a huge amount to eat. Um, and people are going to start going back into Goma soon because they simply can't afford to abandon their jobs and their livelihoods for very long. People are scared that their houses might be looted in their absence, that they might, um, their possessions might be stolen. And so soon people are going to start heading back into town, even if it's not safe to do so. Um, I'm not sure how long it's going to take until we know whether or not it really is safe to go back. Um, but I think a lot of the residents of Goma are, are going to head back soon and simply hope for the best. French President Emmanuel Macron is in South Africa this Friday to discuss supplies of COVID vaccines. His counterpart, Cyril Ramaphosa, has accused the West of what he calls vaccine apartheid, with rich countries hoarding the shots and supplies slow to come to the rest of the world. France is set to deliver 30 million vaccination doses to Africa by the end of the year, and the EU has pledged more than 100 million doses total. One in six people on Earth lives in Africa. Yet to date, just 28 million COVID vaccine doses have been administered on the continent, out of one and a half billion around the world. That's less than 2 percent. After talks with the visiting French president, the leader of South Africa blamed what he called a vaccine apartheid for this staggering inequality. Emmanuel Macron, meanwhile, stressed that while a temporary patent waiver for vaccines was important, the sharing of doses should be sped up. It's in the interest of everyone, because the more we delay vaccinating people everywhere in the world, the more the chances we give to this virus to mutate and come back. The World Health Organization says Africa urgently needs at least 20 million doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine in the next six weeks in order to fully vaccinate people who've already received the first dose. A recent temporary ban on vaccine exports by India has caused the supply bottleneck to the COVAX scheme designed to deliver doses to poorer nations. COVID-19 vaccine shipments to African countries have slowed down to a trickle this month because of the reliance on India as one of the key manufacturers globally. The continent was expecting 66 million doses through COVAX from February to May, but instead has so far received only 18.2 million. Some African countries have even been holding up initial doses worried that they may not be able to give the second shot within the recommended interval. The WHO is urging governments to vaccinate as many people as possible. Even just the first jab would increase the level of protection. For most of us, invasive species are perceived to be nothing more than a nuisance, a fact of daily life with little impact. But a new report released by the South African government says the critters and plants are believed to cost Africa, get this, more than three and a half trillion dollars each year. That jaw-dropping figure mainly the result of yield losses and reductions in livestock-derived income. Sam Bradby's has more from Cape Town. From pom pom weed to the Danube crayfish, from the polyphagous shot hole borer um, to Australian black wattle, 
Invasive species pose a significant threat to biodiversity in South Africa, but also to agriculture, and on top of that, to the country's water supply as well. Now, the South African government takes this issue very seriously, spending enormous amounts of money to monitor and clear invasive species from the land. It's also one of the only states in the world uh, to publish nationwide assessments of biological invasions. The main costs are associated with a decline in ecosystem services, such as fresh water and grazing, and in agriculture as a result of invasive pests. Independent research released earlier this month showed that the African agricultural sector loses the equivalent of 2.9 trillion euros uh, because of invasive species every single year. Uh, that means that the combined economic losses are greater than the combined GDP of all African countries put together. Now, the African Union has promised to set up some kind of emergency financing mechanism to help address the issues of invasive species um, in 2022. Finally, the nominations for the BET Awards 2021 are in. The African continent once again receiving critical acclaim and securing three of the eight spots. Diamond Platinums of Tanzania has been nominated before, but never won the title. Wizkid of Nigeria also made it onto the list. He won the award back in 2012. And finally, last year's winner, Burna Boy, has secured another nomination. The three men will be competing against household names like Aya Nakamura of France and the British duo Young T and Bugsy. The ceremony will take place on June 27th at the Microsoft Theatre in Los Angeles. That wraps up Ion Africa on this Friday. We'll see you next time. Anytime we see you for the club or the television, your body. Show you no, no, say, the thing you carry, if you kill somebody.